Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Megan Rust, Educator for Interpretation at the Frist Art Museum. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation with Rena Banerjee and Mark Scala. We'll, we will begin with a land acknowledgement. The Frist Art Museum's building sits on land that Cherokee and Shawnee Native peoples and elders call their homeland. We acknowledge and pay respect to them. We also acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to the ancestral land and water that support us. Today, we're excited to open the exhibition, Rena Banerjee, Make Me a Summary of the World, the first major survey of the artist's work in the United States. The exhibition is co-organized by the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and the San Jose Museum of Art, and will be on view in our Ingram Gallery through January 10th, 2021. The Frist Art Museum would like to recognize and thank the following people for all of their work to make this exhibition possible. At the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, Jody Throckmorton, Curator of Contemporary Art, Brooke Davis Anderson, Director, and, Tom and Judith Thomas, Director of Exhibitions. Lauren Shell Dickens, Curator at the San Jose Museum of Art, and John Umflett, Exhibition Consultant. The Frist Art Museum gratefully acknowledges our supporters. Rena Banerjee, Make Me a Summary of the World is made possible in part by major grants from the William Penn Foundation, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the Exelon Foundation in PICO, and the National Endowment for the Arts. The Frist Art Museum gratefully acknowledges platinum sponsor HCA TriStar Health, silver supporter, the Sander Shatton Foundation. Make Me a Summary of the World is supported in part by Ameriprise Financial, hospitality sponsor, Union Station Hotel, an exhibition, or sorry, an education and community engagement support at the Wingate Foundation. As always, we're grateful for continuing operating support from Metro National Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few reminders at the end of the conversation, we'll take questions from the audience. Please submit your questions via the Q&A feature anytime throughout the presentation. And thank you in advance for your patience with us as we present this program online. In the event of a technical difficulty, we'll pause the presentation and we'll work quickly to resolve the issue. If you're having technical difficulties on your personal device, please use the chat feature to send Frist IT a message. Now, it's my pleasure to turn things over to the Frist Art Museum's Chief Curator, Mark Scala, and Rena Banerjee. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, thank Megan. You. <laughs> uh, thank you, Megan, and welcome, Rena. It's so lovely to see you. It would be so much nicer to see you in person. Hello, everybody. It's <laughs> great to have you in my studio this afternoon. It's great to be there. What a lovely backdrop. Thank you for the Thank color. You. I love Thank it. You, Mark. Yes. Well, I'd like to just kind of lay a little bit of groundwork for the exhibition and for our discussion. I think it would maybe help people to get some sense of, if you're not familiar with Rena's work, to get some sense of what she has been sort of after for the past at least 20 years, really longer than that. But the survey itself is about a 20 year survey, a 20 year look at work that is engage with ideas that are that, that seem very topical that seem very necessary for this moment but in truth they were necessary 20 years ago and 15 years ago and five years ago and my expectation is they'll be necessary 30 40 50 years from now i mean i think that the whole uh, subject of crisis the subject of migration the subject of uh, uh, racial dislocation, all of these things play a role and I don't think that they'll go away. And I think that, that one of the role that artists, one of the roles that artists have is to keep our eyes on the long game, the long picture. And this is something that Rena, I think, has dedicated her work to and we're really thrilled to be able to present it here. Today, I think it's safe to say the traditional determinants of identity, language, nationality, race, gender, these are constantly being altered or questioned. 
How necessary are they to our understanding of who we are? For some, this has seemed to be a symptom of cultural loss to be resisted. For Rena, I think the process is nuanced and it's definitely open to the possibility, it opens up us up to the possibility of redefinition. So signifiers of identity in Rena's work are embodied in objects, materials, words and phrases, things that when put together in alluring juxtapositions denote a sense of place tied to history, colonialism, trade, migration, in a way that might be understood as psycho psychogeography, our behavior, behavioral and emotional response to place or to displacement. Rena gathers and reconfigures objects from around the world, things like cowrie shells, Chinese umbrellas, Pyrex tubes, and alligator heads. Each has its own history, its own connection to things like function, production, and trade. But put together, these histories multiply and amplify. They become something more exciting and more compelling for us to think about where we have been, where we are now, and where we might be. They frequently allude to South Asia, where Rena was born, but they also tell a larger story about the transmission and adaptation of cultures from colonial times to the global present, about the porosity of boundaries, east-west, male-female, black, brown, and white. The quality of displacement, similar to what W.E.B. Du Bois called double consciousness, is particularly acute for a migrant. Born in Kolkata, India in 1963, Rena moved with her family to England in 1967 after her father, a civil engineer, was recruited to work there by a multinational company, the Brain Drain, part of the Brain Drain. The family moved again in 1970 when her father accepted a position in New York City. In her neighborhood there, rich with immigrants, Rena witnessed the effects of displacement on people's sense of belonging, which was similar to her own experience. She started off her professional life in a very practical way working as a polymer research chemist. But then she did what she should have done anyway, decided to be an artist. She went to Yale University where she earned an MFA and has had an amazing career since that time. Featured in numerous international biennials and museum exhibitions. Her work is in the collections of the Whitney Museum, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the, the Pompidou, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and the San Jose Museum of Art among many others. The exhibition that we'll look at, we're, we're really going to kind of do a walk through the exhibition, Make Me a Summary of the World, includes sculptures, installations, and paintings produced over the past 25 years. So let's go, let me um, see if I can get control of the PowerPoint. There we go. Thank you. So I would like to start with this wonderful quote. This quote, when I, since I first read this quote probably two years ago, when we were speaking with Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, I thought this quote is so loaded, it's so perfect. This is the quote, these, this is the language that a scientist might use. It's so precise and so full of richness and awareness. Um, I'd love to ask Rena, to talk about this quote, to talk about this in relationship with her own experiences. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm overjoyed to be able to share with you the content of my work, but also to talk about what our relationships are together as we go forward and think about uh, reaching the world and also becoming a part of the world. So reaching the world for me, as in this quote, is about understanding how identity uh, forbids us to connect and how it entertains our access. And I think the hardest part about being an immigrant and leaving what was considered your land was this idea of ownership that we come to believe is an end all to a lot of conversations about what does culture bring to you? Who can uh, talk or represent that culture? And I think that kind of violence led me to think about what I'm talking about in this quote is authenticity itself. This idea that there is one singular um, place of representation for a culture, for a people, 
or a gender that in in essence the violence is that we're negating the live quality of culture and that we have forever been migrating we are all immigrants so i come to contemporary culture and contemporary art with this idea that maybe we have the wrong compass maybe the compass is not authenticity which is very much an imperialistic and a colonial project of securing hierarchy and dividing people and in essence does not allow you to participate in the overlapping reaches that we maintain when we become human and this humanness is then a way for us to understand how we belong in nature and the world itself, the planet Earth, is something to be shared and not uh, to be owned and not to be lost in. There is no place on this Earth that I should be have to say is not my home. And so I start with the uh, hope that you will agree with me, that you will come with me in this journey of imagining the world becoming yours that's i think a wonderful expression of, it, it sort of questions the validity or the value of the word authenticity as it has been used because i, I do think that that word to me is more a reflection of how authentically expressive of you of your own human heart that it really has nothing to do with where you're from it has nothing to do with your parents your your sexual preferences, any of those things. It's how, how well do you convey what is central to your core? Um, and I think that that's something that, as I go through the exhibition, I find to be so moving. This, this notion that there is, you know, all there, you're, you're trying to make a summary of the world, which is, uh, pardon my saying so, a, uh, a, uh, an almost futile enterprise. You know, how do you do that? How do you make a summary of the world? But you load it in. I mean, it's all, it's all um, very, very complex. It's all layered and amb ambiguous and rich and contradictory. And that's the world. That's the summary of the world, which I think is really uh, um, carried through in, in all the works that we'll see. I'd like to try to get this to move to the next slide. There we go. This is, we wanted to start the exhibition with this real masterpiece in Breathless Confinement. You, you all can read the title. It's an incredible title. And we'll talk about titles and language a little bit later on. I think the titles themselves are works of art independently of the, independent of the visuals. Um, but in this case, we thought it was really important to start with this work because it has so much to do with your ideas about migration, about the transmission of cultures kind of back and forth, sometimes viewed as a negative, sometimes viewed as a positive. So maybe you could talk about what your thinking was with this work. How, how did you come to this work? So this work um, is really reminiscent of an earlier work that I made in 2000 when I was living in Brooklyn. 2000 was just uh, a year that was full of changes. The 1990s and the 80s uh, really talked about multiculturalism as a positive reach. Um, I went to high school during a time when busing had just begun. And it seemed having finished school in 1995, five years before this exhibition, I had already done a couple of uh, museum group shows. And there was a lot of tension in terms of um, addressing artists who were not white and how to present their work in a way that the audience would be able to read, to become legible. And so as an immigrant, it was really clear to me that although there are different people in one's neighborhood and in one's world, that the fuss around difference was not really to make an artist more legible or visible, but in fact, it was a way in which to caution our viewers that they will not, should not, and cannot 
uh, receive this work. And so in that the very beginning, I began to uh, realize that the New York art world was very insular and that I really wanted to talk about the world. And uh, in, in critiques at school, at Yale, I found myself constantly being bombarded by questions of authenticity as we talked about and also about the foreign. So not only did I represent India, but I represented the whole world that was not American in the eyes of American in 2000. And this was a really interesting time because I began to hear at the Whitney Museum of American Art, where you see this particular piece made in 2000 was staged, that people began to address this American museum as just the Whitney Museum. And so the dropping of the name was very promising and very problematic at the same time. And it was a show of uh, an exhibition which had not one curator, but five in order to address the multiplicity of voices that we hoped in this museum to bring into play in the biennial. So during that time, I chose to do a very large piece in my studio, which is very small and very temporary. And it was a piece that I designed mostly in my head about what it is that I'm worried about. What do I wanna bring into this um, exhibition about talking about this possibility of participating in the world or representing the world in New York. And so I took on the subject of the visual AIDS programming, which is AIDS itself in the year 2000. And this was a real um, concern for New Yorkers, but also for the world. And there wasn't a place to talk about anybody else except people who lived in New York. And it was shocking to me that a place could be so provincial. And it was shocking to me more because in talking about disease, you realize the urgency of people coming together to be able to exchange information and to organize around ideas of progress, modernity, uh, democracy, all of these things that take on really the problems of the world. And so I made a piece that was more a figurative work that had two heads. It had a tail. It was insect-like as I felt at the time that my identity and my foreignness made me smaller, even though very much in clarity, one would say that the world was foreign if you lived in New York City. And so these kinds of contradictions began to take on meaning and connections about how we address our aversion for people who are different. And very much so, I thought, that our version is the way we experience disease or insects, like the West Nile uh, virus was very much um, uh, identity driven. And a lot of diseases, the way they were being named at the time, were about places outside of the US. And so in this kind of figurative work, I have this really ravaged body, it looks decaying, it is complicated. It looks like intestines might be coming out. It might be an insect. It has arms, wings, and then it has this trail of tubing. And so I began to think maybe the materials I use in my work could have meaning itself. And the address to meaning and material could be very much a part of the conversation, the content of the work. And so this is really the first time that I started to make titles. And my title for that 2000 biennial was not a short one, which was Infectious Migrations. It was a long one and it was cut out, censored out at the time. So I became more and more involved and in the title, in addressing context. What is text? How is it dis different from visual? What is drawing? Can a drawing be in a sculpture? So here you see these drawings behind this uh, figure, which I say would be like insect almost. 
And the drawing are found drawings that I found in Brooklyn of the Hospital for Disease Control, Columbia University. And they were drawings that were abandoned in 1968, made and abandoned in uh, 1990s. And I kind of reached out and uh, approached the uh, uh, architectural firm and gathered them. And then I was beginning to think of this idea of hospitals and modern buildings and how they were created and to think of buildings as bodies and what was very much uh, a thing in the 90s were all these old buildings as we know grand buildings in the united states and in new york were being converted to be better more appropriate for use by making them modern and they were being modernized by these uh, ventilation systems, the guts of them had to be taken out. And so these, this kind of language about gutting a building and putting in ventilation systems and, you know, talking about sick air and fresh air and electrical systems that would feed. It was very much a conversation in architecture and in engineering that was about the body. So I addressed the uh, architecture that you'll see um, in New York City as bodies that were being rejuvenated for the- I love, I love your comments about the body and you, you have managed to find a way to layer what appears to be almost a map of the world, the way the, the, way the tubing spreads out over the wall. And it seems the tubing reminds me, uh, obviously it, it may be medical tubing, but it reminds me of veins and arteries. And so that connection between the, the vessels with which things are spread. And it makes me think about today's pandemic and, and you know, any, any, you know, the, the, um, the Spanish flu in 1918, you know, it makes me think about this notion of geography tied to illness and that the carriers, as you mentioned, the uh, AIDS uh, patients or uh, people suffering from AIDS in India were, not people suffering from AIDS in the eyes of certain others. They, they, were, they were the disease themselves. They were the carriers of the disease and they became the disease. And I think that that has a wonderful metaphorical connection to the idea of the outsider, you know, whether it's the- Yeah, absolutely. The, and, the, and this was not only in India, but it was also in Africa at the time. And yeah. uh, medicines were not available to them as, as it were, and it was also a dialogue that, ha or a conversation that had to be had about how poverty works in the world, yeah. and who is sick, and how poverty is treated as a sickness that is rejected. And yeah, so, yeah, exactly, the outsider is a kind, of a kind of a yeah. um, pathology. Yeah. So you do see this kind of idea of growth. Um, I began to use uh, both organic materials like Spanish moss and cowrie shells to really think about commerce. So you'll see these cowrie shells in the actual eyes of people that they in fact see money when they see. And so um, you can also really look at my work both literally, figuratively, you can think of it as metaphors, you can think of uh, how I use netting and jewelry to think about how in our own history in, in the U.S. we've addressed the, these things as decorative, for example. I was very interested in being able to conceptualize how we can use these decorative things to mobilize ideas about our socialization. And so at that time, there was a lot of tension about having political ideas in the museum in 2000. Yeah. And as you know, 9-11 happened quite soon after, and there was this kind of resurgence of um, nationalism around 9-11 that took place. And so we're looking at a really long journey in a retrospective um, from how that, uh, you know, those changes have taken place in the work itself. Well, I would love to move to Viola because I think that we've talked about, about 
issues and, and ideas that are really epic and panoramic in scope. Big ideas. And I think that big ideas can come in a very personal way as well. And the sculpture Viola, which I, I'll show the, uh, the title in a moment because it's an incredible title. This is based in a, in a, in a personal, an actual story, a, 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 a biographical uh, source. Can you talk about, about the, in, the, the beginnings of Viola and what you hope to arrive at with this sculpture? So it was a project I was doing in New Orleans. It was Prospect 4, the fourth one occurring. And uh, you, New Orleans is quite a unique space in, within the United States. It was a time that my daughter Ananya was going to school at Yale and she told me about her class that she was taking. And it was a class about uh, Black Bengalis in India. Um, Black Bengalis came to the United States at Harlem on steamships from uh, Calcutta, where I'm born. And she told me about this migration that took place in the 1800s. And this migration was a migration of approximately 300 uh, Bengali men that created a kind of network of uh, migrants who were bringing um, silks, dry goods, um, what would be considered decorative silks of embroidery, so skills, knowledge about fabrics, and they were bringing it to the African-American community who had joined in a collaboration of sorts when, when they themselves uh, were coming in as a, a migration from the South, escaping slavery, escaping the uh, oppression of the Jim Crow era. So the collaboration took place between these Bengali South Asian men and African-American women that they married. One such woman was Viola, Viola Ida Lewis. And I began to look at this, what was then the census uh, uh, kind of descriptions of not only uh, Bengali men, but all the variety of immigrant women that came and uh, married different people in the United States. So I was very, interested in Viola's history and how the collaboration between these significantly different people of different histories reinvented and solved their immediate problems to survive in the United States. And they did so by creating these dry goods uh, stores where during the Jim Crow era, she would not be able to take on that. And so what was more interesting about the writing or the uh, documentation, the primary documentation, was the mislabeling of different ethnicities to create a kind of legibility again, a kind of adherence to American ideas of what is foreign and who is American began in that time and began to be an emergence of different voices that would uh, play tug of war of how this happens. So many of the children of uh, mixed couples became mulattoes and the women who are African American were called South Asians or Asian Africans. And so there were all this use of inventive use of uh, naming that took place in the 1800s and very different in different cities, uh, including Prospect. So this particular piece, um, in terms of how it was made, it was made with wings. Viola would have multiple wings. The wings would be draped in a very intricate uh, beadwork. The beads would be from India. The cloth would be wedding gowns for, uh, that were available in New York for Korean weddings. Um, I wanted to use uh, American antiques, like the sconces that you see that light up. And I wanted to think of um, Irish miners at the time that were coming as immigrants and were also in this, involved in the struggle to survive. And so you, she is a miner 
She is a traveler. She has landed. She has landed America. She has the parachute behind her. And Viola is also a rescue worker for all these different immigrants. And she's traveled a long way from the South and she has come to all the shores and every city to find work to make what would be now a very rich cultural history in New Orleans and all the cities. What would these cities be without this kind of wealth of culture? She has rakes on her side. She's tilling the land. The rakes are from India. There are apple seeds that hang on her arms and there's uh, Congo elbow rings, which represent money or was used as money. There is a Ferris wheel of um, frozen doll children, of porcelain white children that are wrapped in silkens. A lot of the uh, labor of immigrants, like my own mother, was um, in taking care of other people's children in New York City. So I don't think I ever, um, talked about that before. So it's, it's really loaded. It is not only a summary of other worlds and other migrations, but a summary of my personal migration to see my mother try to survive. So Viola takes on all these possible movements. And so there is a lot of movement. There is an echo between the Ferris wheel and the large floral, floral dome that is her parachute that helps her land. There's a, a light, which is the beacon light on the floor. It's a kind of marine light. And there's the light of her own reflection. And you can't really see it very well, but there is a pink uh, flesh tone glass head behind the Aruba mask that she wears. There is the Murano Italian horns that were made for me um, in you know, 2013. And they are the incisors that literally have to dig with her own body into the land itself to make room. So all that always gets me very excited, of course, to talk about. But I really wanted to have this kind of flutter of things that are uh, disorienting in some ways to come together as a single force of life and the single force of humanity, which I see as a flower. It's an astonishingly rich and loaded work. I can imagine uh, several PhD dissertations coming out of this, uh, trying to uh, uh, break it all down, but the way that you've synthesized it all into an image of extraordinary beauty and power, I think is, is a reminder that art is about the synthesis of ideas and then the, then the kind of the, the transcendence of the same ideas. They, they, the ideas lead you to something and then the work itself takes over and it becomes an extraordinary experience to just stand in front of, and st stand in front of this sculpture. It's really quite remarkable. I did want to um, bring everybody back to the title and I hope that when I had it up earlier that you had a chance to read it. We're not gonna read it out loud because that would chew up a little bit too much time. But it is a title that is packed with history, packed with uh, very individual history and emotional perspectives, but, but allusions to much larger aspects of history. So it's, it's a really incredible title. And I think a work of poetry. You are a poet as well as a visual artist. So make me a summary of the world. Again, I think that's a pretty large order. And it reminds me of the old explorers in the old days that would bring back things from Tahiti or bring back things from, from uh, Japan or India or South Africa or um, Chile uh, and bring them to the museums and the universities of the West. And with the idea that we will just accumulate everything, we'll study everything, we'll figure out how it all works together and that's what science is all about. That's what the Western empirical method is all about. Um, the idea that you can actually do that, really understand the world by having all of its parts at your disposal, I think is a, is a bit of a fallacy, but it's also a wonderful ambition. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about this work in that context. 
Well, Mark, I think the most important thing I learned about the uh, impulse to summarize the world is, is a very imperialistic impulse, is an impulse that believes that the world could be reduced into miniature things, yeah. into a game board where everything can be considered because of the overreaching view of a central force of power, imperial power, that can summarize every place that they go to. This was a colonial period which marks our colonial impulse today. And I think it's an impulse of uh, fearing the world, fearing that you can't manage it to make the world become a product of commerce, to, to milk the world of all that it is made of, to milk the earth of all that is made of, needed this kind of summary, a list like a laundry list, a list like a shopping list, what do we have in the world? What do we have in the forest? What do we have in the mountains that we can take and bring back home? The summary is about collecting everything that is never before seen and um, trying to figure out if it's worthy of our bringing back. And, and in that moment of discovery, uh, whether it's uh, this uh, discovery of Columbus or the discovery of a new place where a new place is always a place you don't belong. And it is a place where you begin to think, I must then record, examine, decipher, and then really control, to control what is out there so that it becomes mine to have. I love the connections that you make uh, between imperialism and that empirical impulse. Um, and I think that there is, a, there is also a very interesting consideration of globalization. You know, how do we move from imperialism to globalization? How do we move from people traveling to far corners of the world to people sitting in their apartment in New York and buying things from all four, all four corners of the world. What is, what is the leap there? What, what can we take from that? Well, you know, this piece really dedicates itself to this idea that when the world becomes a shopping place to some of effect, you're no longer looking at the world. You're looking at a store. In the same way, I'm, I'm referencing authenticity as well as making a place into an object that is legible, visible, attainable, and policed. And so when we stop policing the world into places and with boundaries that prevent them from the coming and the going, we really stop this kind of imperialism when we do that. But it is always a, this kind of storm that I think in this sculpture, I'm readily using those materials of nature that were pocketed for sale, like uh, American bison horns that you see, the black horns that stretch out, and they stretch out like swords to come out into the space. And the swords are almost flanked as if it's a skirt. There is great beauty in seeing that ability to control, a kind of seduction that one experience when they can have everything in the world, to eat everything in the room, and to make everything into fruit and food is, is a very human nature at the same time. But to eat everything in one day is very scary thing about human ability. And so looking at the colonial period we're also thinking about the industrial period and how much the world gave to places like the United States to become what it is today. How much money came out of these places, how many bodies died and how many bodies were sacrificed 
to make what we consider, you know, the modern, the contemporary. And in doing that, there is this kind of chaoticness in my work that when I assemble things together, there is this attempt to make it both like a flower, as I mentioned before, but also to make it uh, into a nature that is hard to manage. And of course, we experience this a lot when we try to install my work, you know, to decipher where do we start and where do we end and how do you know when it's ended? And I ask that myself of my own work. And I have to say, I take great pleasure in improvisation, which you will see. And in some sense, there are items and objects that I brought together that communicate in a way that appear to be fixed. And there is a certain um, gesture that is maintained in this work, especially, which is very gesture driven it allows the umbrellas to be one here, one there, but from exhibition to exhibition in all the different venues, there are iterations that cannot be controlled. And this is very much invested in how I make the work. And so the assembly of objects have certain kinds of inability to be recreated, to become permanent. And so that's very important, the work. The other thing is to use things that were remade by Rena. So in this piece, I'm very excited that these two umbrellas are Chinese umbrellas. They were made with Japanese linen that was found in Japan that I brought back. And some were delivered to me by residents there. And then there was the body of the doll. It's a Victorian doll. and I redid her face so she no longer looked like a Victorian European uh, face. And so I changed the racial content of what I'm saying in every claiming of other culture. So I'm cl claiming them as things that I play with, the things that I speak to. And so everything is manipulated, but very minimally. There is a kind of relaxed pleasure in playing with them. It is not the kind of playing where you melt down gold and remake something else and you cannot recognize what it is you're looking at. And that's very important in the lineage of the work. Yeah, I love the, I love the fact that you're bringing in the word play to the, to the conversation. Uh, because I think there is something playful about a lot of your work and not just the process with which you make it, but also the, the information, the messages that come out of the work. I'm going to actually jump ahead to a world lost. We're gonna uh, pass over when signs of origin fade because we're running a little short on time and I wanna make sure that we have enough time to talk about that and then for questions and answers. So let me just do that. And let's see if we can, um, Still having problems with this. Sorry about this, there we go, there's that. I think Megan has a hand in it. Okay, so this is a world lost. And when you were talking about, when you were talking about improvisation, this immediately came to my mind because this is a work that I think you have adapted for various institutions, for various displays. And you're very sensitive to the, to the geography of the museum, the architecture of the museum, but also the geography of the museum and in which it's found. Can you talk a little bit about this work? It, 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 we placed it in the area relating to humanity's relationship with nature, which I think is a very you know, fraught subject, obviously, and we're, we've, discussed you know hybridization and kind of the fluidity of our relationship with nature this this is a very packed work can you can you give us some background on this well i'd love to mark so the the thing about this work and i th think because we're doing it online uh this talk i'm going to go through what you're actually looking at what stays the same in this work is this dome 
This dome is a continuous series of domes that I use in a number of large sculptures as well as small sculptures. The dome is made, as you can see, of steel. And it's made in a way that it replicates the design of an umbrella, which you saw in the last slide. It can open and close. And so the first domes were very much like this, a canopy, like the colonial canopy. But in this particular piece, this onion dome was set upside down. And so you see a taper on the bottom. And what you see in front of you is an empty dome, that it's no longer covered. So a number of my domes before are covered. And so you see a shape of a dome. Here it is a skeleton dome. And there are red threads that grip onto the rods that make the skeleton of this dome. And below that in its narrowed place when it is upside down is this little finale and it's made of all these shopping baskets that are made of wire and they were cut and placed and patched. And there are a multitude of light bulbs, empty light bulbs, I call them, but they're basically uh, burnt out light bulbs. And these empty light bulbs, like the empty seashells, um, are some of the remains that are thrown away where the body or the life has gone, like the life of a life I'm referencing. And so the horns, the buffalo horns, the American bison, again in this piece, in similarity to the sculpture we saw before, flank out like swords. And it is a very graceful object. And underneath it very uh, clearly, is a, a French colonial um, scale. And the scale in this replica of an antique holds a nest. It's a brass wiry nest on one side and a colorful gold leaf and red mushroom on the other side. The mushroom on top of it holds an ostrich egg. And the ostrich egg uh, is painted. It's an empty ostrich egg. There is no egg inside it. And it's painted of some of the largest rivers in the world that allowed commerce to take place for migration of both objects and people to take place. And on the other side of this balancing act, which is so fragile, is a bar of gold or a representation of a bar of gold. And it begins to tinker. And as people move around this object, there is a little shaking that happens. And the dome itself, you'll see, Mark, when we have audience soon, <laughs> I hope, you'll see this little flutter. And the threads begin to sway a little bit. I have this vision for this piece, A World Lost, to think about what would happen if all in this storm of discovery and commerce and migration, that we lose everything because of global warming. This piece was made originally in uh, 2013 as a, a solo project at the Smithsonian Sackler. And it was an important time where I really thought about my, again, my personal experience going back to my um, growing up. Uh, a trip I took with my mom to India. And we took the trip because I was of age and she wanted to marry me off. And she wanted to dis, um, dismantle all the land that she may have owned in Dhaka and outside of Dhaka. So I didn't know this before, but apparently she told me that women own this land and it was, men, it was not men. And so the deeds would come in her name and she would sign off. So she went into this little house to sign off with the magistrates um, after we got off the train. And my dad and I stood outside waiting for her leadership. And then the next thing she did was to take me to the land that we gave up and we sold. And she said, now we're gonna have to tell the poor people in, on the land um, that they can't have the land. And I said, mom, I thought we were the poor people, you know? What do you mean the poor people? 
we went to this mud house by the pond and there were two children that welcomed us. I would say the one child was two years old and the other child maybe six or five. And it was one little girl who offered me uh, water because she could see I was foreign. And so a glass of water was to be made. They didn't have a kitchen. It was one room. It was a dirt floor, which is the dirt floor my mom grew up in in Dhaka as well. Um, but there were not rooms after rooms. And in this uh, a, a kind of architecture, this girl to, who was two years old um, started to dig with her brother a hole. The water came up. This is the water from the pond. And as the water came up, um, she opened up her raised skirt of her dress and her brother poured the water into her dress, which acted as a filter while he gathered in another glass cleaner water for me to drink. Wow. And that's an amazing course, story. It was, and these are the same plastic glasses that I use on the floor. And it is really about how vital water is, but it's also about the human exchange of the traveler being thirsty and producing water when you have nothing, you have nature. And you exchange nature between the traveler, the foreigner, and the people who are at home. And so the world lost is very much a contemplation of what it means to be at home on the earth and then to lose that home. I think it, it makes me think about the role of rivers in spreading civilization or in spreading humanity. You know, again, that it, it brings me back to the veins and arteries of in breathless confinement. The in rivers are oftentimes referred to as arteries, carrying people from the from the interior out to the rest of the world, carrying explorers from the rest of the world to the interior. Uh, civilizations, towns, communities pop up alongside rivers um, and almost automatically start to pollute them. You know, obviously they're one of the things that we, they, they're the central aspect of human survival and yet we do what we do with these plastic cups and throw them into the river and then they gather on these plastic islands in the ocean. So it's obviously you're, you're, not, you're not posing a solution to this problem but certainly recognizing the dynamics with which, and, and generally it's, it's people of the greatest poverty who struggle the most, I think, with, with pollution and with, uh, uh, you know, with industrialized nations throwing their junk in, into, the, uh, into the poor nation's backyards. Um, so it's a very, very complex. You've made this also in some way an homage or a reflection of Nashville's own flood. Can you talk about that? Um, you know, rivers and how rivers are used, how they're maintained, how they are eroded, um, what we get out of rivers. Um, rivers are holy places in South Asia. Um, and just visiting the Mississippi, it was clear that the river there is a holy place. Um, as I went on my field trip here, and a lot of cities are banked on these rivers. A lot of rivers become a way to feel connected to the land. L rivers grow and they recede, they become dry, they're like looking at the sky and deciding what tomorrow will be like. They talk to us. And in thinking about how pollution has created a very visible understanding of how we've impacted the world um, without realization, that access to water, whether it's nutrition, um, health or to as a mode of travel 
rivers became a way for those um, Black Bengalis to escape the horrible oppression that they were going through in India because of the British's inability to see that they needed to have a means of survival of commerce, which was an ancient profession for them. And so as the cities in Liverpool began to make fabric, the Hooghly River became even more vastly um, spiritual and more vastly important to survive. Um, and leaving that to come to Harlem talks about that ship talks about migration um, and escape. And I think water, it means so many different things and are very prevalent in a lot of ceremonies um, that are religious. Holy water, we, we talk about. So many cultures have baptisms about with water. It is a, a place of rejuvenation and renewal. And so I almost, I think we were talking yesterday, Mark, about what this is in my, in my head. And so this is a kind of octopus, which is all the rivers that come together into a single body. And I, I did that, I realized a lot with the other piece we saw, the turtle piece, when signs of origin fade. It is about like, if all these, like a summary of the world, could come together, if we could talk about the subject of water, how to bring water to everybody, how to take care of the ocean, um, a lot of these things were going through my head. Um, you know, the experience of the two-year-old making water for me made me realize she knew more about how to achieve that than I did as someone who was educated to engineering and then art. I didn't know this is how you make water. We're so uh, not in touch with taking care of ourselves. How are we gonna take care of everyone else? And I think uh, the, one of the privileges of, of being an artist is to be able to contemplate how one does that, to see our shortcomings and we see it from so many different viewpoints. And we have to see it in this critical light in order to realize we're missing something in our blind spot. And I think um, the word loss is very much about uh, discovering ourselves, our individual means of participating in the world to um, align it with the stars in the way that nature uh, could have given us ample resources to do. Throughout your work, there is a kind of a, a vocabulary of, of the tendril, of the, the, almost like the vine, you know, that, that kind of runs through and it's very linear and it's a little bit, it's snaking and it alludes to the, the transmission of air, of blood, of water, it alludes to flow and passage and the ephemeral. You're using solid materials to describe something that's not solid at all, something that's very, very open and something that is essential to human existence. And I think that this work captures that essence, in especially the the role of water in an extraordinarily powerful way. I love the idea that art can change the way we see the world. We can think about the world in a different way, in a much more complex and empathetic way by looking at works like this. I'd love now to turn this back over to Megan and uh, invite uh, Q&A, invite uh, questions from anybody who's listening. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Rena. Um, we can take Thank questions you. via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. I think we actually have a few people watching in our auditorium at the First Art Museum who have joined us um, to watch there. So if you're at the First and want to send a qu question, Anise Daly is in the auditorium and can get your question to us. 
Um, we do have one from Courtney. She says, Mark and Rena, thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Do you mark a difference between the practice of installation and that of sculpture? And if so, what is the difference? Um, I think that uh, difference has always been something that we've come to realize as a, a point of um, talking about scale um, to some um, because an object, if it can be held as a cohesive one, sometimes that is more often referred to as uh, sculpture. An assembly of uh, things referred to in a room, in an environment as installation. Those are things I've heard from other people. But I really think what is different about uh, installation and sculpture for me, Courtney, is that when I'm thinking of making an installation, I'm really thinking of, about the body of the human participating to, as I said, with world loss, that kind of movement that allows an object to slightly uh, respond to the movement of the wind created by people. I've always had that um, experience. Where it's almost like a ghostly experience. And then there are these things that are about lighting and the site to evoke the building that you're in, like at the Frisk Museum, the post office. Mark and I had wonderful conversations about that. The floods in Nashville, which graced the hallway. Those are the things that make the sculpture in that room, which we sometimes call a museum, an installation in my mind, because it's talking about the who are those people who will come into these spaces? Where is this sculpture installation living? So I think that my sculpture, the way I see it as an installation is participating in a dialogue with the building, the housing, the floor, um, the people I work with, you know, I really need that experience of where am I? Where, how did I get here? That journey. And so all those things become really the fuel of making it an installation, which is live in many ways because it can change over a period of time. It can, it's not static. Um, so those are things I gravitate towards. Thank you. Neil asks, Rena, how does your background as a polymer research chemist inform your work or does it not? Well, as many of you might already know, um, we're in this hot topic of plastics today with it awareness of what it is and an education that we must have. Um, so it was a very hot um, uh, profession to go to for me at that time when it was emerging and it came out of this um, motion to have uh, make money in the United States to make create jobs and more manufacturing of plastics. So I'm very aware of what plastics are and I do use it in my work. Um, what I do use is plastics that are recycled from domestic space often. Um, netting, you know, the pink Taj Mahal that I reference sometimes uses the plastic that I actually encountered while wrapping food for my refrigerator. And I made the first model, you know, in the kitchen using the pink saran wrap. So plastics in everyday use are a resource for me in the work. They're not usually new plastic. I think I can only think of one place where I have used new plastic, but they also allow me to bridge myself into understanding where these materials come from in our, um, our history, you know, and how we make new materials still from the earth that we seem to forget that plastics come out of oil. Um, and that the resources we use to make these 
uh, plastics are purposely um, veiled from us so that we have this idea that the synthetic things are not organic and therefore they are free of nature. They are man-made as if man can make something that isn't already in nature. So it instills in us this kind of philosophy or idea or wish to be gods that we cannot be. And in terms of a humanity, our maturity demands that we become very well versed in the materials that we use, we wear, and we ship. And shipping, uh, whether it's people or things or making of a, a car or an aircraft, the fuel we use, the, the weight of education is so much uh, a target of our ambition as human beings that we are forgetting how much our survival depends on it and our health depends on it. So I think um, they really become, my choosing of materials are really uh, about provoking thought and education. Thank you. We have time for probably one more question. We got one from, I'm gonna to try to pronounce her name right. She's pronounced it phonetically for me. Dorotha, Dorotha here. Um, in using organic materials and actual skeletal representations of once living animal beings, do you believe that you are honoring the essence of our human story? If so, in what ways? have you not discussed yet? So I do use um, seashells. Um, I use um, more replicas of skeletons rather than actual skeletons. But I did earlier in my work use um, skeletal heads from taxidermy. I was very interested in the history of taxidermy and the history of preserving the dead, um, how we use fragments of what is dead in our work, how it evokes our spirituality, our connection. It is not the same thing as the way we proceed a trophy from a hunt that is on the wall. It is a way for us to realize that this head of this mouse in my work is also my head you know, and our familiarity with our body allows us to be familiar with everything in the world, even mountains, that there is something on the outside of a mountain, something inside of the mountain. The inside outside requires us to consider that the journey that we would have to take conceptually of understanding these layers refuses us to know instantly and immediately what everything around us that we see is, and whether it's alive. And the very definition of what is alive and what is dead is being challenged when, if you hold in your hand a skeleton and say, it's still alive. What does it mean to say that? And I think we do that with ideas of inheritance, that they're very, the person we love is very much alive in our hands if we hold a lock of hair in Victorian periods or um, in Egyptian period, if we see the mummy, you know, these early human beings and their, their uh, journey into understanding what the world was around them and the possible travel to other worlds, the promise of traveling again after death becomes very much the journey of a lot of spiritual uh, mythology. And it really talks more about this human impulse to be always engaged in not only movement, but movement with the past intact, with the future being unimaginable. And I think um, really, I mean, I think it's, it's about understanding that we're alive. 
Thank you, Rena. You've given us so much to think about today. And thank you for sharing your beautiful works with us here in Nashville. Thank you, Mark, for a great conversation. And thank you all for attending this program this afternoon. We want to invite you to come see Rena Banerjee make me a summary of the world in person at the Frist Art Museum. You can reserve your time ticket for admission on our website at fristartmuseum.org. A few people in the chat asked about recording. We are recording this, so we'll hope to get it on our website startmuseum.org soon so you can watch it again or share with your friends and we hope to see you in see you soon either in person or virtually at our next online program you can find out more about our upcoming virtual programs by visiting fristartmuseum.org by following us on social media at fristartmuseum or by signing up for our weekly email newsletter as you leave the zoom tonight you'll be invited to take a brief survey a link will appear in your browser your feedback is important to us and will help us improve future programs. And finally, we're so thankful for your support of the First Art Museum. Financial gifts during this time allow us to bring you great programming like today's conversation. Support of any amount is greatly appreciated. Please consider making a donation at firstartmuseum.org. Thank you again. Thank you, Rena. Thank you, Mark. Hope you all have a great afternoon. See you soon. Thank you for coming. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye, Rena. This was fun. Bye, Megan. Bye.